All right. It is now 7 p.m. And in the room I've got over there, my son Matt and my wife Kathy, my team, my marketing team. And uh, Kathy's having a little trouble hearing me. I think it's because she's got her uh, headphones muted. You probably click mute. All right. We're okay. Good. All right. Well, I'm Jeff Tucker, Doc T. Another presentation of Horse Talk. And I'm going to try something this time. I'm going to try to um, stop my screen stop sharing for just a second. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop screen sharing. No, stop screen sharing. Okay, and I think you're supposed to be – there I am. Okay, we set up this really nifty banner in the background. This is all about free horse talks that are on every Sunday – or pardon me, every first Sunday of the month. And I just want to let you know that I'm a live person. This is a horse's advocate, and you can see in the background the horseadvocate.com is my website. And this is the place where we talk about all sorts of things from lameness to um, – you know, farm thing. I love that. Nutrition, diseases, reproduction, and we've covered a bunch of them. Actually, this is number 11, um, the, my 11th horse talk, uh, which means it's just been about a year. So, um, and what's really cool is if you ever want to watch these things, you can go to the horses, uh, pardon me, to the equinepractice.com and then put forward slash horse talk and then a number. Anywhere from 1 to 11, you'll see these all. Uh, the truth of it, of course, is I only have 11 today, so maybe tomorrow I'll end up putting the rest of the numbers in. But I'm trying to make it easy for everyone to find these things. Um, today we're going to be talking about dentistry, uh, the top 10 things you should know about teeth. And most of you know that I am uh, – that's what I do. I'm an equine veterinarian, but my practice has been limited just to dentistry since uh, 1998, and I've been actually working on a horse's teeth since my mentor Cornell taught me how to flow teeth in 1983. So 1983 to now is a full 33 years, which is a lot of time, and I've seen over 65,000 horses, mouths, uh, and that's quite a number. So um, I want you to know that I'm coming to you with some sort of expertise in this because this is what I do every day. In fact, right now I'm floating approximately five horses every day of the year. That's 365 year days a year. Because uh, I've shared the load uh, with my partner, Melissa, who isn't here right now tonight, night off. But um, together we share the load. And um, before she came, I used to do a lot more, about 10 horses a day. So that's where we are. Now I'm going to go back to screen sharing if I can. And I'm going to start ripping through these things. But before I'll let you know that I've got these 10 things, but some of them are just me talking. I'll, I'll come back to this non-screen sharing thing I want to do, and some of them are um, uh, lots of pictures, and some of them are kind of disgusting pictures. So if you don't have a good, good stomach, uh, hang in there. All right, um, here we go. The top ten things you should know inside your horse's mouth. Uh, and I'm just going to run down a list. Uh, horses chew a lot. <laughs> you, may, you may laugh, but that's a really important point that I want to go over. I'm going to do a little bit of math. Uh, oh, that's one thing I wanted to say. If you go to the equinepractice.com forward slash horse talk 11, uh, and if you go there right now, if you, if you can multi-tab and get over there uh, while listening to me, you can see the outline of my whole talk there. You just scroll down and obviously don't have the video up because we're just doing that now. That will be put up later tonight or sometime tomorrow. But the outline is there, so if you want to look at it and follow along, uh, it should be mirrored uh, there. That might up and um, put it in front of you. You can do that too. But horses chew a lot. Horses are continuous eaters. The purpose of chewing, why did horses' teeth even need floating and how often? A little bit about young horses and old horses. And what else can happen inside the mouth besides sharp points? What are some of the signs of dental problems and the different processes of dentistry and who should perform it? And of course, finally, why do we prefer horsemanship dentistry? All right, so there's the URL, the equinepractice.com forward slash horse talk 11. Uh, later on, maybe by tomorrow, I'll have all the other horse talks, uh, 1 through 10, I've done this way, so it's easy finding. And uh, one of my goals in the next couple of days is to make it a lot easier to find things at the website. So let's start off. Horses chew a lot. These sweet horses I've known for a long time, um, they're eating a bunch of hay in their mouths. They, they, I, in fact, it took me 
five minutes just to get their head up out of their head to, to look at me and take this shot. But I want you to remember this one thing. And in fact, if you fall asleep and don't listen to anything else, I want you to remember this one thing. If a horse is chewing, his teeth need doing. And it's kind of a catchy phrase that uh, comes to me, but what does it exactly mean? Well, a horse chews between 10,000 and 40,000 times every day. So if you take the number that's right in the middle, that's an average of 25,000 times every day. Now, 25,000 times seems like a lot, but let me give you a, a little bit of a, a thing, to, a relationship here. If you take 60 seconds and multiply it by 60 minutes and multiply that number by 24 hours, you're going to find out that there's 86,400 seconds in a day. Now, if each chew takes a horse one second to chew, then there's plenty of time in a day for 25,000 chews. It really is about a third of the day. Now, I actually know the woman who did this research. She's a professor emeritus, um, a VMD, a, a Pennsylvania graduate of the vet school there, who is a, a professor emeritus in behavior at Cornell. And she did the study. Uh, it's really hard to find. In fact, uh, almost impossible to find. But um, this something she wrote, and I believed her. So 25,000 shoes a day, I want you to multiply that by 30 days. That's 750,000 shoes every month. Now, humans, according to my dentist, chew about 2,000 times a day. I'm not talking about opening and closing your mouth for talking. Obviously, I do a lot of that. But 2,000 shoes a day uh, times 30 days is a lot less. And in fact, 2,000 shoes a day times 365 days still doesn't equal 750,000 shoes that a horse does in a month. And if you multiply that times six months, it's four and a half million shoes. And in a year, a horse chews nine million shoes every, every year. Now, that's a lot of chewing. And if the horse is chewing, the teeth need doing. Please, if you could just remember that point. So here's a picture of a, a horse skull looking from the bottom up. And you can see the V shape of the mandible. That's the lower jaw with the nipper teeth or the incisors on your left and on the right obviously is the rest of the head and it V's out. I want you to notice, in fact, wait a minute, let me see if I can do something here. This is, I don't know if you guys can see what I'm doing, but there is a way. Let's see. Can you guys see my pointer now? Kath, can you see my pointer? You still can't see my pointer. I've got a ginormous pointer. Uh, it takes about 30 seconds to get there, so maybe um, everyone's behind. So hopefully that point will pop out. But I want you to notice that the teeth on the upper jaw that's facing you are so much further wide set than the bottom jaw. Um, oh, Terry says yes. Christina says yes. So anyway, um, I'm sure you guys will let me know that you see the point or two. Yes. Okay. Very, very tiny. Gosh. Okay. Well, anyway, the point is the upper jaw is a lot wider than the lower jaw. So there's a, this excess is overhang. And here's another view of it. This is just from the side. You can see that the lower teeth fit beautifully in the upper teeth, but they don't fit perfectly top to bottom. Here's another view of that. And you can see how it's... Um, um, how it, it, it overhangs. Here on the inside... If you can see, this is looking from the back of the skull forward toward the uh, nipper teeth. And if you look in this archway, this lit archway, kind of looks like a light bulb, uh, you're going to see some of the sharp points that are there. Um, and that's, here's another view of it. You can see the inside teeth of this pony has very sharp teeth. And these are sitting right next to the tongue. Where we're looking is where the tongue is. You can see those sharp points. And on the outside, you can see the sharp edges of the upper cheek teeth that rest right next to the cheek here. So these are, these are major, major problems um, in the horse. These are the sharp edges that start. And, and just think about this. The horse's tooth continually erupts. And I'm going to get into that in a second. But this is the sharp edge that if you're writing with a pencil and you don't turn the pencil, one edge gets really sharp. These are the points that occur. But what's even more important is the stropping of the tongue. Now, strop is a word uh, that most people don't use anymore, but our grandfathers used to have a long leather strap, and they would take their razors and go back and forth on it. And it was called stropping the razors. It's like stop with an R. 
so stropping, and that's the leather of the tongue moving against these teeth and it polishes these, these teeth into a razor sharp edge. This is the these are the points, both on the outside uppers and the inside lowers, that do the damage and cause pain in the horse. So horses are continuous eaters. And these guys obviously is a, a typical scene that every one of us has seen. The horse with the heads down grazing all the time. Remember, twenty-five thousand times a day. But what you don't know, a lot of people don't know, is a horse doesn't have a gallbladder. A gallbladder is a sac that lays inside your liver that stores the bile that your liver produces. And as you eat, that bladder compresses and pushes out some of the, that bile into the intestines. Hold on a second. Got to take a sip. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that, um, that bile is used for meals. Um, dogs and cats have them. Obviously, we have them unless they've been taken out by surgery. Cows, sheep, goats, deer, all these ruminants have one because they truly are meal takers. Even though they are constantly harvesting grass, they don't actually eat it until later when they eructate chew their cud. So just about every animal you know has a gallbladder except odd-toed unglets, and those are hooved animals that have one or three hooves. Um, I know my buddy Chris is on here, and she's the zoo expert. She knows all the animals. And she'll probably uh, chime in here and say something like, um, maybe there's a couple of the animals she can think of. But anyway, the horse doesn't have a gallbladder. And so that's proof positive in my mind that a horse is a continuous eater. If you don't believe me, um, take a horse that is not eating for 24 hours and you'll look at his gums and they'll start to turn yellow or jaundiced or icteric because the bile is continuously coming out. They also have something called hypsodont teeth, and hypsodont teeth is a fancy word for they continually erupt. Um, I've got these backwards, so I'm just going to go here. This is a mechanical pencil, and I want you to think of this as an analogy. If you load a mechanical pencil up with a piece of lead or graphite, whatever you want to call it, um, and then you start writing, as you use that lead up, you click the little button on the side, and more lead comes out. Well, that's basically what the horse does. So here's the tooth of a fairly young horse, and it's in a person's hand. And over here by the pinky, you're going to see a yellowish bit of tooth. That's what we call the crown of the tooth. That's what's above the gum line, and you can see the red gum that's next to it. But from there, all the way over to his index finger, that with all the blood on it, that is the rest of his tooth. That's the lead inside the mechanical pencil. And over time, this reserve crown gets shorter and shorter and shorter until it gets to the point, just like the mechanical pencil, when you run out of lead and you click it and nothing else comes out, you can actually go in with your fingers and pull this lead out. You can also do that with old, horse, uh, old horses that have end-stage teeth. You can just come in here and grab the crown, and there's no reserve crown, there's no root system, nothing is left in there. That's one of the important points of dentistry that every uh, horse owner should know. So what is the purpose of chewing? And this is a really interesting um, idea because uh, we never take, we, I think all of us take chewing for granted. Uh, but it's so important because it's the first step in swallowing. And if you can't chew and you can't swallow, or if you can't chew the food into something you can swallow, or what I call a swallowable bolus, if you can't create a swallowable bolus, you will starve. And it's interesting because, um, uh, unfortunately, one of my client's husbands uh, was unable to swallow uh, from a stroke, and he couldn't live anymore because he couldn't eat. So that's how important it is to have the um, – the, the, uh, chewing mechanism work. Now what's really interesting is there's roles for every one of these teeth, the incisors, the canines, the wolf teeth, and the cheek teeth. And I just want to go over it just a little bit. The incisors are the first teeth that you see right behind the lips. And I'll show you pictures later on of a horse that is missing all of his front teeth. Now the role of the incisors is basically to bite other horses. They're defensive we weapons. Now a lot of you say that doesn't make sense. I, I thought it was to bite grass, to, to in, ingest grass, to harvest grass. Well, it's not because these horses without any incisors can harvest grass just fine. In fact, if you look at a horse with parrot mouth, that's where the top and the bottom uh, front teeth don't come together at all. I've never seen a skinny one of those. Those guys are usually fat and happy, and they're eating all the grass they want. 
And if you look at all the ruminants, the cows, the sheep, the goats, the, and the deer, who don't have any upper incisors at birth, they just never have them. They only have the lower ones. They do just fine harvesting grass. And if you go on my website and you look at the uh, slow motion videos that I have of horses harvesting grass, you'll see that they actually lick it up with their tongue and rip it off between their tongue and their upper teeth. And so the teeth are just handy, but they're really not there for anything other than to attack and bite. And that's as far as I'm concerned. I know that's thinking outside the box, and maybe a lot of you are, are thinking I'm a little bit, you know, whoa, out there on that. But this is just my experience of all these years looking at these teeth. They don't make a hoodoo difference on the horse's ability to chew grass and to remain, uh, keep their weight on. Now, the role of the canines, that's really interesting. The canines are those teeth of male horses. They're not usually found in the females, meaning the mares or the fillies, but they're in the male horses, whether they're gelded or not. And they are also weapons. They're there to tear flesh. And they sit there in a position where they get stropped by the tongue in a way that turns them into daggers. With a front and back edge, it's razor sharp and a point. And they can puncture and tear flesh very, very well. Now, if you get a, a female with, with canines, that's a horse that is a little bit more masculine. They'll usually be dominant, assertive, um, hard to train if you're not a really good trainer. Uh, the best horse to train and work with because they're like stallions many times in their ability to connect with a human. So uh, mares of the canines um, is kind of unusual. Uh, the role of the wolf teeth, uh, they're just teeth that are being phased out over time. Uh, there is no role for them. Uh, whether we should pull them or not is totally between you and your equine dentist or veterinarian whether you want to pull them or not. And the role of the cheek teeth is what we're talking about. They are there to chew and make a bolus. And it's the cheek teeth that have to do all the heavy lifting to grind it. And it's an orchestrated movement. Um, and, I, and I forgot to put this in, the purpose of chewing. It's an orchestrated movement between the teeth and the tongue to rotate the bolus of food and get it back from the front teeth to the chewing teeth and then finally to the uh, place where they can swallow. If they um, don't swallow well, this is what you'll see on the ground. This is just a bunch of hay that the horse is leaving because he just doesn't feel like um, – Chewing. This is not quitting. I'll show you another picture of quid, Q-U-I-D. But this is just a horse that just leaves this because it's just too hard for this horse to chew. And this chew, this horse had a problem. If you look at his right cheek between his eye and underneath the halter down toward uh, his jowl, you'll see that all the muscle is gone on this horse. This horse had some trauma, some damage, and he's lost his ability to open and close his mouth on the right side. Here's another picture of this horse, and you can see it looks like a skeleton here. And you can see his mouth kind of remains open, but actually, in reality, that's as far as his mouth can open. It's almost impossible, no, it is impossible to open this horse's mouth any further than that. And so this horse has difficulty chewing. Because of that, this is the way his front teeth look. And a lot of people spend a lot of time talking about the importance of aligning the front teeth and making sure they all look good. But in reality, this movement that you're seeing here is caused by the inability of the horse to chew with an unrestricted movement. It's either caused by pain or in this case uh, can, um, scar tissue that's not allowing him to open his mouth. And the tongue actually goes across these teeth and it, it's the tongue that wears this down. I'm going to show you another picture of what the tongue does to the incisors a little bit later on. Um, forgive me, I have so much to go over so much in this, and we're already uh, 20 minutes into this, 18 minutes into it, and I've got so much more to cover. So this is a blisteringly fast uh, overview, but these are some of the most important points that I want you to understand. So why do the teeth need floating and how often? Well, the chewing causes the points, and the tongue strops them into a razor's edge, and those razor's edge rub against the tongue and rub against the cheek, and it's the pain that's created by this that prevents the horse from chewing it um, and having movement that's free and unrestricted. So just like if you had a little hitch in your side or in your uh, something in your shoe, you're going to alter the way you walk. Well, it alters the way these horses chew and move their tongue, and from that, a lot of things occur. In fact, when I sat down with Dr. Patty Dixon over in Edinburgh, Scotland, actually he's in Glasgow that day, um, 
we talked one on one uh, over lunch, and he asked me, "What about uh, incisor reductions?" Which is something a lot of uh, dentists do. They are so concerned about the incisors. And I told him back in 2002 that it was not uh, the incisors, but the lack of movement of the jaw and lack of the proper movement of the tongue that's causing this. And back in 2002, now Dr. Dixon is is probably a leading researcher in equine dentistry, or has been, co-authored many books and papers and uh, head of the uh, surgery over in Edinburgh uh, Vet School. Um, he said they're just starting to realize that over in, in uh, the Great Britain. Um, in Great Britain, they said that uh, it's not the incisors, but something's happening, the back teeth that's causing this. So it's really nice to get validated on that. Okay, um, the, individual, uh, the individual threshold of pain, this is so important. If I pe put a pebble in your shoe, an identical pebble in your friend's shoe, and have you both run to the end of the barn, one of you is going to hobble and complain that it hurts too much, and the other person is going to say, what's your big deal? It's just a small pebble. Let's go running. That's what we call a wimp or a tough guy, and that's the threshold of pain, and horses are no different. So the horse, if he has a low threshold of pain, will alter the way his uh, jaw moves, it will alter the way his tongue moves, and these horses are really responsive to good to get um, um, uh, floating and removing of oral pain. So the purpose of telling I already went over, here's something else, the hardness of the teeth. A lot of people think that the teeth are just teeth, like, uh, I don't know, a rock is a rock. But we all know that you have soft rocks and hard rocks, uh, soft steel and hard steel, soft wood and hard wood, and teeth are no different. In fact, they're made up of prisms. Um, that they can see under the electron microscope, and they've categorized them as one, two, or three, um, and I call them hard, soft, or brittle. And the hard ones, they're even hard to float with sharp blades. Soft ones, it doesn't take anything to file them down. It makes it so easy to file, but on the flip side, they get a sharp edge quicker, and this is common in young horses under five years of age. They're teeth are almost always on the softer side. Now, as they mature, get toward 10, the teeth get harder. So as a horse gets older, they don't get as sharp on a regular basis, especially as they hit 25 to 30. A lot of times, these teeth stop getting sharp edge at all. Um, the brittle teeth actually break off and they chip. They, they chip into razor sharp, sharp edges. And I've had several teeth, pardon me, several horses in my career that Gosh, every six months, they've got two or three or four new little chips that are digging into the tongue or the cheek, and the owner knows it because they can feel it. And finally, what they chew and how often is important. There's a, a, a theory out there that when horses are turned out on grass, they have something called silicates in the grass that they propose uh, causes the teeth to wear more. Well, in reality, they just chew more. They're on the 40,000. Uh, times per day versus the 10,000 times per day. So a lot of horses that are turned out on that lush grass fields in Kentucky, uh, when they come back to Florida, I can tell that they've been turned out for the summer on this grass. Um, also, I've had several horses that have a liquid diet. They, they have some sort of medical reason for them not to have uh, a regular diet. So they either have oil-soaked chopped hay or they have a slurry or soup. Um, and these horses often go more than a year and still not have any sharp edges because they're basically slurping their food, if they could, through a straw, and they just have no need to chew. All right, let's talk about young horses for a second. Young horses have things called caps, which are the deciduous teeth, which are the baby teeth, which are the teeth that fall out. And you and I remember when we were young, we also had teeth that fell out, and for our parents or grandparents, we saw it on our children. And it's all the front teeth, all 12 of them, the six on top and the six on the bottom. And it's also the first three teeth on the upper and lower cheek teeth. So the first three cheek teeth that go back, those are called premolars. They're not molars. Premolars are teeth that have a pre, uh, precursor deciduous tooth. The last three teeth are the true molars. That's why I call the back teeth, the cheek teeth, as a group. So the first three cheek teeth are the caps, and these baby teeth fall off somewhere between three and five years of age, and same with the front teeth. So these horses actually lose um, 24 teeth between two and four and four and a half years, five years of age. Uh, so it's a very dynamic time. And if you're the type of person who's training a horse during this time and you want to get the most out of them, you need to have this horse see the dentist on a regular basis because um, you can pull the teeth and they could have a, a 
or file the teeth, and a month later they could have a tooth that's falling out because it's a, a um, what do you call it, a, a baby tooth. Wolf teeth, to pull or not, that's between you and your vet. Um, there's no purpose to wolf teeth that I know of. On occasion, they've already broken. Uh, you're going to pull them out, and they, the root's broken off. I've never seen a broken wolf tooth cause a problem, with the exception of one horse in 65,000. So I'm pretty much uh, not concerned about broken wolf teeth. Blind wolf teeth, uh, I've got a picture up down here. Okay, here's a whole bunch of uh, baby teeth. Um, there's two columns. This <laughs> it didn't all come out of one horse. This came out of a bunch of horses at the racetrack. Um, and unfortunately, it's not that great a picture, but it can just show you all these baby teeth. Uh, here's another bunch of them that I put on a ledge uh, with a chewing surface facing up and the fingers that hold the teeth in place facing down. Um, some of these little edges, the, these little protuberances or what I call fingers that hold the cap on, sometimes break off and remain in the gum line. And that's called a cap remnant. And we're constantly looking for cap remnants in horses. They, they're usually found within 12 months, 6 months of the tooth breaking off and you have to go and dig them out because it's just like a foreign object and it can attract uh, food and cause a local infection. But sometimes these little things don't come out till they're almost 16 years old. That's I think the oldest we've ever found a cap remnant come out of a horse. So they can linger for a long time. Uh, right here is the first cheek tooth, this big tooth that you see. But if you look just in front of it to the left, you'll see a small nub. I don't know if you can see my, my cursor now, but I'm just circling it. That's where the wolf teeth lie. And there's usually two on the top, but they can have two on the bottom. Uh, some thoroughbred Shetland ponies, donkeys, they constantly have two teeth on the bottom. So they can have a total of four wolf teeth. A lot of people don't know that. Here's a pair of wolf teeth that I took out. They're sitting in the palm of my hand. Uh, they don't have much of a root system. They don't have much on top. Um, that's because the word vestigial is applied, which means they're being phased out. Here's a blind wolf tooth. Um, you can see the tissue that's all covering over this tooth. The tooth doesn't sit up and down in the jaw like a normal tooth. It actually is in an unusual spot and it's laying horizontal or parallel to the jawbone. And so it never gets pushed out and erupts. So it stays under a capsule of soft tissue. And a lot of trainers like to have these things taken out. Uh, I'll leave that up between you and your dentist as well. I, it, I stick my finger on these and if it doesn't hurt, then we aren't too worried about it. Okay, here's the foal with what we call um, eruption bumps. And this one has it on the bottom jaw. You can see these two lumps under his hairy chin. And you can also see in front of his eye, along the white stripe toward his nose, you can see a couple lumps there. If you think of these teeth kind of like the rocket ship taken off from space to space, as it blasts off from Earth and it pushes uh, down on the Earth to lift itself up, the fact that it's pushing down on the Earth is often... Uh, not seen by us because we just don't realize that it's doing that. And the result is the rocket ship goes up. Well, as these things start to um, uh, eject out and, and, and these permanent teeth come in, uh, it's going to have a little bit of a bump behind it that's going to be created here. And so these are called eruption bumps. Here's another view of some eruption bumps down here on the lower jaw. It's nothing to be concerned of. They can be get very big. Uh, horrible if you're in a halter class because there's nothing you can do about it. Um, you can't pull the teeth prematurely. That's not in the horse's best interest. Um, but you just have to let it ride through, and then sometimes it takes six months or even longer for those eruption bumps to disappear. All right, in the old horse, um, here's uh, a couple things. End-stage teeth, quitting, prevention, uh, plus genetics, and feeding toothless horses. I want to show you what an end-stage tooth looks like. Do you remember that tooth? that I showed you that was on that man's uh, blue gloves hand and how long it was. Here's the opposite. In between the tongs here, the forceps, is what was showing on the horse and to the right of that, what's in the red, that's just, that's just the remainder of the tooth. There's nothing there anymore. So this is another end stage tooth that came out and this one was not boiled or prepared. It basically was dead and just hanging out in the horse's mouth and I was able to pluck this out with my fingers. You can see that there's just nothing attaching this tooth anymore. And horses that have these kind of teeth often do this. Now this is quidding, Q-U-I-D-D-I-N-G, and these are quids that are on the ground. I guess it's an old British term. I have no idea where it came from. But that's a quid, and they're balled up uh, piles of hay sitting on the ground. 
Uh, horses, old horses notoriously have this. And some of the things a horse can have are end stage teeth, um, horribly maintained teeth. Um, a lot of horses' teeth just fall out. Uh, then they have nothing to chew the hay, and you keep giving hay to these horses, expecting them to chew it, but they have nothing but gums. So now we have to uh, feed these uh, toothless horses a little bit differently. We have to make something more of a slurry that they can suck down, get very finely chopped hay, soak some hay cubes in water, do something like that to allow the horse to be able to chew things and get it down. Okay, I'm going really fast. Um, we're 30 minutes into this, and I want to go over a couple other things. Um, this is, what else can happen inside the horse's mouth besides sharp points? Okay, here we're going to have a bunch of uh, photographs, and these are always the fun things because it's almost boring to think about all the regular things, but I want you to just pause for a minute and realize if a horse is chewing 25,000 times a day or 9 million times in a year, it's absolutely incredible that these horses can do what they do uh, and live like they do. But we end up putting a bit in their mouth and asking them to do things. And oftentimes these sharp edges can cause uh, a lot of riding problems. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But I thought I'd throw in a mix here of some um, what I call problems. All right? And some of these problems are cavities, split teeth, abscess, tooth roots, this fancy thing that I call ugly teeth of old horses, uh, foreign objects, trauma, and ulcers. All right. This is a messy looking mouth, and it's really hard to see what's going on here. Um, it was really cool, but this tooth, the second tooth back, is split up the middle, kind of like if you took a log and put a wedge in it and, and drove that wedge in and you split the log into firewood. That's what's happening here. I know you can't see it, but I went in there and cleaned out the hay that was stuck between the two teeth. And now that with the hay gone, I went back in, and now you can see a section of tooth is laying right up against the, the cheek here, and yet all the way to the right is all the, the rest of the teeth. So that piece of grass had worked its way up in here and had driven a wedge in here and split this tooth. Here's the piece of tooth that I took out that's now lying on the stall, and that's how thin it was. Here's another picture of that tooth between my fingers. That's all that was there. Let me just go back, and now I hope you can see it laying up against the cheek. And this horse is having some trouble chewing, obviously, and this was very easy to take out. What's really interesting to know is as that grass goes up there and wedges this thing apart and splits it, at some point it just snaps off from the healthy tooth that's underneath, and all we have to do is take out this fractured piece, and the rest of the tooth remains healthy and happy. So this is no big deal. I get one of these in every 30 horses I see, somewhere between 20 and 40 horses, but it all depends. Sometimes I see a bunch of them. Sometimes I go for a dry spell. But it's pretty common, and this can happen no matter how well you take care of your horse's teeth. But that brings me to another point. Prevention is so important because prevention can allow the tongue to get in here and clean things up. And it's a good thing to note right now how important that tongue is. We talked about its ability to uh, form a bolus by rolling the food around and positioning between the teeth. But we didn't talk about how important the saliva is and the distribution of that saliva because in the saliva is something called immunoglobulins. And that's the antibodies that get in there and actually kill the bacteria. Because remember, what's inside the mouth is still outside the body. It's a very dirty place. And all the food that's going in there is coming right up off the ground with dirt and bacteria and all sorts of stuff. So we have to start coating this uh, stuff with the, the, the weapons that we have to kill it. And that's where the saliva comes in. And the tongue helps distribute it. And if the tongue can't get in there and distribute that saliva, then um, you're going to get focus of infection. And that was what was happening here. The tongue wasn't able to get in here and clean things up. And that's the important thing. Another thing about the tongue, seeing that I'm here, is how important it is in, in the integrity of the attachment of the tooth, that in the chewing. I want you to think about something called disuse atrophy, which means if you don't use it, you lose it. And if you don't use your teeth, they lose that attachment of the tooth in the socket. They actually start to wiggle. And many times I've gone seeing a horse that's 25 years old and older, and they've never seen a dentist, and I come in there and start floating their teeth. They actually wiggle. They rattle. They're loose in the mouth. And I take away the sharp edges, 
and I'll come back as little as one to two months later and I'll go back in and stick my file in there and those teeth have become firm in the sockets. It's kind of like if I came up to you and gently pushed you on your shoulders and did that for 30 days and as I push your shoulders you push back using your core strength in your legs just to resist that gentle push and put on your shoulders. After a month your core strength would just increase. Your legs would become stronger. That's just the purpose of the tongue. So the tongue has so many things. Uh, sorry, speaking about tongue, I had to wet my whistle. Uh, the tongue has so many important structures or functions. It forms a bolus, it helps form the bolus, it helps push the food back toward the swallowing point. It stimulates the attachment of the tooth to the uh, to the uh, socket. It uh, coats the food in saliva to help lubricate it for swallowing. It coats the mouth with saliva to help um, kill the bacteria, and it gets in there and cleans everything. In fact, if you want to right now, take the tip of your tongue and feel every corner and every edge of your tooth, front, back, top, and bottom. The tongue has such an ability to get around and move around the mouth. It's just incredible. It also has the ability to stay away from something that hurts, like a canker sore, or in this case, a sharp tooth is digging into the cheek or tongue, and when it stays away, that's where a lot of dentistry problems come up. And that, my friends, is the reason why we float teeth right there. All right, this is something called EOTRH. It stands for equine odontoclastic tooth resorption and hypersemantosis. Now, you don't have to remember that. You can just remember the word I used to use called ugly teeth of old horses. And there's so many uh, ways to look at it, but if you have an older horse, uh, I'd say 15 and certainly 20 on up, that has ugly teeth, it's probably EOTRH. You can have x-rays done. In fact, that's why they came up with the name after taking x-rays. They're able to come up with this uh, tooth resorption um, idea. But until we're taking x-rays of the mouth, we just called it ugly teeth of old horses. This is the same tooth that I, that I took out of that horse, um, and it's just a nub. It's all rotted away. There's just nothing to it. Canines never come out of a horse, but when they come out easily, it's called cause of EOTRH. It, the whole tooth is swollen, basically exploding. It affects the canines and also affects the uh, incisors. And this is a really classic and advanced case of EOTRH where the teeth are starting to erupt out of the mouth. Um, it's loaded with tartar because it's just so painful for the tongue to come in there and clean things uh, that the horse tries to not take care of anything. So you have tartar accumulation on the bottom teeth and on the canines of this horse. These, and you can see all the material, the food material that's packed between the tooth and the gums. And what's really amazing is with just some sedation and a little bit of um, traction, uh, these are all the teeth that we took out of this horse. There's nothing holding them in. They were not healthy. They're not helping the horse. The horse is painful. Now, I'm not going to show you what the horse's mouth looked like right away. I'm going to show you what it looked like uh, several months later. And this is the mouth all healed up. And you can see how nicely it healed. But all the top teeth are gone, and all but one bottom tooth is gone. And the only problem with this, and this is kind of interesting, I want to show you how this horse went around. There's nothing to hold the, te the tongue back. Because all the teeth were gone, this horse, unless he's constantly thinking about it, would just let the tongue hang out. And I have a video of this horse actually harvesting grass with these lack of teeth. He has one lower incisor, and, and I ask you on the video just to listen uh, because you can just hear the horses ripping up the grass beautifully. He needed no incisors to eat. Um, I want you to put in the back of your mind the fact that this horse's tongue is hanging out because his front teeth are gone. I'm going to go um, into that toward the end of the uh, lecture about how the horse's teeth and older horses tend to uh, go from vertical to horizontal. And it's basically because the tongue pushes them out that way. We also get foreign objects. And here's a stick that was uh, completely across the hard palate. Uh, went from one side of the horse's mouth to the other. And the owner is wondering why the horse is having trouble eating. So here it wasn't dentistry, uh, but it was just uh, a stick that was stuck. <laughs> and, uh, and I took that, that stick out. And the horse needed drugs to take it out. It was really painful. Uh, but when I took it out, you could just see the relief on that horse's face. It's just amazing. Uh, this is really common. Some horses ball up uh, a ball of hay the size of a golf ball, maybe a little bit smaller, and they tuck it behind their very last teeth in a little so um, uh, place, a little um, pocket 
that they make in the cheek and it just stays there. And I'll go in and it's rolling around. It's just, I don't know if it's a habit or what it is, but I see this um, very commonly. This is a really interesting finding that Melissa found. Here we had a horse and she says, what's this? And we kind of looked at it and this is the um, gum line, uh, the upper jaw. The tongue is on the bottom. You can see kind of the dots of the tongue. And, and it's not really in focus and I apologize for that. But there's just something here. So we pinch it with our fingers and look what came out of that hole. All this plus there's a couple more, but this came out in the first jaw. That just is amazing. And this is what was left. And actually, you can see the dark hole above the finger. But if you look a little bit up to the left, and I don't know if you can see my cursor going around here, but that's the other hole. It was a pass-through hole that just went right along there. And uh, we've come back and done this horse several times. And in fact, I believe uh, Melissa's going to see it again tomorrow. Um, and every time we go there, it's filled up with hay again. So it doesn't seem to bother the horse at all. This is the tongue that was on the uh, advertisement for this webinar, and uh, this is really interesting. So we have this tongue pulled out pretty far here. It's not hurting the horse, uh, but I wanted to show you this thing. I call it a guitar pick. It was very fascinating, and we didn't know what it was. Um, it was hard, it was thin, um, and the horse actually really didn't care what it was. And, and so we started to pick away at it, and as we took the tartar off, we found this metal object that was on the bottom of the tongue. And this is it after it's gone, uh, and it's kind of a bloody mess. And this is what it was. And I had to cut that piece of uh, metal out. But it was a metal staple, and this was the uh, tartar that had been attached to it, and it had been there for years. And what was funny was that we talked to the owner, a young lady, and I said, did you notice anything? And she said, no, didn't notice anything at all. Yet that's what was going on. And this is what the tongue looked like six months later. All healed up is beautiful. The tongue, the horse just kept moving. Notice how smooth those edges are on the teeth, by the way, because we floated them. But that's a foreign object. Sometimes you can get an ulcer, and this is a very profound ulcer on the tongue. You can get them on the cheek and the tongue. Um, and this, this is caused by um, a, a chronic abrasion that this horse is getting. And this horse I didn't see again, so I don't have a follow-up on it. But I just want to let you know, this is what an ulcer looks like. It's not really infected. It's got a nice clean margin. Uh, it's bright red in the middle and nice white pink edges on the side. It just will never heal because it has some sort of abrasion that the horse is doing chronically. We also get uh, stained teeth. This is um, some staining of the teeth and the tongue. We don't really know what causes this, but tongues can turn black. Uh, some people think that it's clover, but I've seen it on horses that have no access to clover. But there's got to be some sort of feed that's going on that's turning this uh, this black. And maybe somebody can comment uh, later on in this post once I get the video up and tell me what it is. Here's a horse that rests his tongue against his front incisors in a way that it creates this chronic uh, abrasions on the tip of the tongue. So. This is just a small example of some of the things that we've seen go on inside of the horse's mouth that almost every time doesn't cause any problems to the horse except that broken tooth I showed you in the beginning. But all these crazy things that go on, the, um, the EOTRH or the, um, uh, the guitar pick in the bottom of the, well, the, the, the staple, these horses seem to do just fine. Okay, signs of dental problems. Um, Quitting, we've already gone over. I'll show you, I think I've showed you pictures of quids that's balling up of hay. If you see that, uh, it's most likely the horse is having a problem. That's to be, um, that's different than uh, an inability to chew. Uh, some horses just don't like the hay that you give them, especially uh, down here in Florida as we get close to June. A lot of hay is an annual crop that's cut uh, around June. Uh, sometimes in May in some states, more southern states, but in New York and the northern states and in Canada, it's usually June. So we're getting the worst of the worst hay now being delivered, and a lot of horses hate it. It usually doesn't taste good. It's long. It's stocky. It's the stuff they couldn't sell before, and a lot of horses will just chew it and spit it out or just turn the nose up at it. Here's the biggest deal. If the horse is hungry and doesn't want to eat or chew, that's usually a tooth problem. But if a horse is just not 
then it's usually a sick horse. That's the rule of thumb. So if your horse just one day just doesn't want to eat, is turning his nose up at everything, he's usually sick. If the horse is eating everything like your treats and and the grain and, and everything else that you put in front of them, all the grass, that's a good one. They're eating grass just fine. But you give them the hay and he turns his nose up at it, it's probably the hay. Bit objections. Now this is where a lot of people uh, see a lot of problems with their horses. They put a bit in the horse's mouth and the horse objects considerably. I want to show you something. This is called what I call flabby cheeks. It's a name I developed um, because and it, it's just flabby. And this particular horse that I'm taking this picture on was so sensitive to floating that it was impossible to float because uh, the horse was just absolutely said no way it just hurts so much this is an extreme amount of flabby cheek tissue or excessive or redundant uh, fat tissue that lays right here on the mouth and it actually drapes over the first cheek tooth and in this particular horse when you pulled it back there's an actually an ulcer where it just worn itself here is the same horse with a thumb going in and pushing that fat down and what's really good about this is if you have a horse that has extreme sensitivity to a bit, especially if you're a rider that uses a double bridle, two bits, if you take your horse and carefully place your finger and the thumb, uh, your thumb down on the bars and push this and push back and you get this wave of tissue coming back, your horse does have flabby cheeks. Here's another uh, version of that. Here, uh, Melissa's thumb is just pushing that fat, and you can see how it just ripples up over there, and that's exactly what your bit is doing. And most people who talk about bits and the use of bits and proper riding never go into this. And once I show them that this, their horse has these flabby cheeks and they're very sensitive, it makes all the sense in the world to these riders. So what we tell people is to use the thinnest diameter bit possible and try to get out of the horse's mouth. Start riding with your seat, not with your hands. And what we try and do is we round up the first cheek tooth to be as round and smooth as possible. A lot of people call that the bit seat, and if you want to call it that, that's fine. But it's because your horse has flabby cheeks. I will tell you that about half the horses we see have it. The other half don't have this. And usually if they're under five, they don't have it, although on occasion they can. It's usually it's an older horse thing. But once they get it, it won't go away, and half the horses that have it could care less. So what I'm saying is 75% of the horses, or three out of four horses, don't have a concern here. But 25% of the horses have this, and if it's being pushed back, and these are one of the horses that are really sensitive, this is where your bit problem is coming from, and you really have to address it. Uh, the other thing I want to tell you is, uh, if a horse changes his chewing behavior, uh, if he starts to cock his head, uh, jut his jaw to one side, lift his head up to kind of let gravity take the food uh, back rather than getting his tongue. Or if the horse is starting to chew in a more choppy or fast fashion, kind of like gobbling his food, that's usually a horse that needs its teeth done. Also, and this is the important thing, it's an insidious onset. So in other words, it comes on so slowly the horse becomes used to it. A lot of times when we see these horses, we take the sharp edges away and they can't chew for a couple of days. They actually are, they need time to reconsider how they chew without the pain. And it's kind of uh, fascinating to watch, a little concerning to the horse owner, but it does happen. All right, we're down the home stretch here. Um, I just want to talk about the different processes of dentistry and who should perform it. And uh, that's the question that seems to drive everybody batty. And I will tell you that back in 1997, I was invited on the New York State Equine Practice Committee to discuss who should be allowed to float teeth and who shouldn't. And the vets didn't care. The vets didn't know um, any reason why a veterinarian should do it. Their bottom line was if you're a good, good veterinarian taking care of things, you don't have time to float teeth. Well, I think things have changed. I think a lot of veterinarians are looking at um, their uh, business and they're looking at ways to to make an income work, and that's fine, uh, and they're looking at floating as uh, something that should be done. Uh, but I believe floating is husbandry. No different than trimming um, hooves or clipping hair on a horse that can't sweat down here in the summer heat. Um, it's basically taking excess tissue that the horse isn't using, and we're dubbing off the sharp edges and making them smooth to uh, take 
all the pain away from the horse's mouth. And it's something that should be done on a regular routine basis. And you have to do a lot of them because um, it's a process that you have to learn. Um, so I believe that floating should be a husbandry act. Unfortunately, not all the states agree. Uh, many states prevent non-veterinarians from floating teeth. Um, and some states, almost every state, doesn't allow a non-veterinarian to use power tools. So if you've got a dentist using power tools or administering drugs, uh, that's totally uh, legal in just about every state out there, with the exception of Oklahoma, which allows non-veterinarians to administer medication prescribed by a veterinarian for uh, dentistry. So whenever you have a horse that needs a tooth extracted or to be medicated, that's the act of veterinary medicine, and a veterinarian should be doing it. Or uh, if they are allowed in the state under indirect supervision um, and you're a licensed uh, vet technician, then it's possible. But every law, every state has a different law. And as far as I'm concerned, if you're hand floating and you don't use drugs, then it's a husbandry act, and, and uh, non-veterinarians should be able to do it for one reason only. But there are so many horses out there, and there's not enough veterinarians to cover it. We have uh, about six and a half to nine and a half million horses in the United States, but I'm also thinking globally. There's about 100 to 112 million horses in the United States, depending on who you read, and that's a lot of horses. And according to the AAP, last time um, at the last AAP meeting, the American Association of Equine Practitioners, they said that 99% of the veterinarians take care of only 10 million horses, asses, and mules in the world. That means there's about 90 to 100 million horses, asses, and mules out there that are only getting 1% of the veterinary care. So I believe that um, the act of floating teeth is essential to the comfort of the horse and its well-being. And I think more people learn how to float teeth without using drugs, the better off the horses will be. Um, I have written down here, but where is Rome? There's an expression, all roads lead to Rome, <clears throat> and I think that whether you use hand tools or power tools, they're just two different routes to get to the same result. But the problem is there are some, pe there are some um, dentists and veterinarians who think that the end goal of floating is to adjust and balance and equilibrate the mouth, and others like myself who believe that just take care of the horse's pain and the horse will chew to their level of comfort. That's what I believe uh, my Rome is and what I do in my practice is to take away all sorts of pain inside the horse's mouth and I do it using hand floating horsemanship. So no, all dentistry is not the same. There are many different ways to get there. It's whatever you're comfortable with, whether you're comfortable with the vet or the dentist that you have in your area. Uh, if they're legal or not, that's totally up to you. Um, and whether they use drugs on every horse that come in there or not, it's totally up to you too. Uh, I just prefer to do it another way. Okay, I just want to go over a couple of other things. I've got like five more pictures here. Uh, I want to talk about the relaxed space. This I took um, uh, four pictures of uh, each horse, of ten horses of each age, between two and thirty, and so that's something like I don't know, eight hundred or. 900 pictures or something like that. And I was amazed that I found so many horses with what I call the relaxed uh, space. And there's so many equine dentists out there who have a theory that you have to adjust and balance and equilibrate the mouth because these teeth, these front teeth, come together and if they don't come together properly, uh, the horse won't be able to chew and, and, and not be healthy. But I saw so many horses that in the resting relaxed place, their teeth didn't come together. Just like you right now as you're listening to me, you're not clenching your teeth. And a horse is chewing 25,000 times a day. There's only one third of the day. The other two thirds of the day, he's just resting there with his mouth kind of relaxed like this. So the whole idea of balancing the mouth to uh, pr prevent a temperament with a joint disease in a horse, to me, sounds a little far-fetched. And that's a whole other subject about TMJ uh, issues, but uh, I want to go into that maybe on another time. The other thing is, here's a, a four-year-old horse, and I want you to notice where the tongue lies. The tongue, just in a resting horse, is jammed up behind the incisors, laying over this canine. And you can see how the tongue laying over the canine of this horse can actually sharpen it into a dagger just as it runs back and forth. But I also want you to see how vertical these front teeth are in a, in a four-year-old. Now here's a, um, I think this is a, 
17-year-old horse. And you can see that the angle of the incisors has now moved. But you can also see that the, the tongue just rests behind here. And if each chewing motion 25,000 times a day, the tongue goes out, licks the ground, and comes back in, he's basically pushing his mouth open with his tongue. His tongue is basically acting like a ram, forcing the mouth open, licking the blade of grass up, sweeping it back in and chopping it off. The front teeth don't come together. Again, look at this relaxed play space. And now here's a much older horse, and look where this tongue is lying. This horse is in the relaxed state, and the tongue is just pressed up against here, and through, uh, in this case, he was 28 years old, 28 times 9 million chews. Um, sorry, that's, that's above my pay scale. That's 28 million chews, something like that. That's how many times this horse has gone and pushed these front teeth out. And so my belief is the reason why the horse's teeth get long like this or long in the tooth is basically because the tongue keeps pushing it out. Okay, we prefer horsemanship dentistry mainly because 90% of the horses that we do um, just need floating. Um, and I think that's a conservative. I think it would be as much as 95% just need floating because I think about 5 to 7% of the horses we actually extract teeth. There's broken teeth. There's EOTRH. There's something going on. But 90% of the horses, uh, which is the vast majority, they just need floating. And we do that um, statistically 92% of the time, which means 92 out of every 100 horses we see, we do without drugging using any medication at all. Which is really cool. And one thing about medication, in my last couple of minutes, this is really critical. When I do give medication to a horse, it's potent painkillers. That's what I give. I give drugs that kill pain. Where most other dentists out there are giving a sedative. And sedatives, by definition, just sedate the horse. Uh, it can make the tongue uh, or the inside of the mouth a little numb. Uh, xylosine does that beautifully. But dermostane and other drugs just basically schnock of the horse and make them immobile. And I don't think that's in the best interest of the horse. It's just making it more easy for the dentist to get in there and do it, but it's not really medicating the horse properly. So my position and my um, way of doing things, I like to use uh, potent painkillers. In fact, uh, two out of three drugs that I use are controlled substances. Uh, they're morphine-like, um, and they're, they're extremely powerful, and that's what I use. Uh, we try to have the horse become a willing partner in the process, and a willing partner is what we want. And whenever we work with a horse, we don't want to be forcing ourselves on them. We want the horse to be uh, asking us to help them, and that's what we do. Because dentistry is a process, not an event. Changing the oil in your car, that's a process. It doesn't matter whether it's here or California or Vermont. The, the, the car's oil is going to be changed the same way. But when it comes to a horse, each one is an individual living, breathing animal, and each one has its own wants, needs, and desires. And we have to connect with each horse one at a time. And that's what horsemanship dentistry is all about. And brings us so much excitement and so much um, juice in the morning to get up and go out there and do this. And, and that's why we do it this way. And our goal, of course, is to remove all sorts of oral pain. Okay, so here are the take-home points. You ready? I'm going to take another sip of water. Memorize this. If the horse is chewing, his teeth need doing. It really doesn't matter what sport you're in, where you live, uh, what the lifestyle of the horse is, whether it's just turned out in the backyard or it's being raced for the Kentucky Derby. If the horse is chewing, the teeth need doing. Nine million times a year, you bet you the tongue's going out back and forth and it's creating this. It's not how sharp the teeth are. It's a threshold of pain. There's plenty of horses that I have to do more than twice a year to keep them out of pain. And the riders tell me, the horse tells the rider, it's not me telling them. They call me up and say, my horse is having a problem, get in here. I float them, and they say, that did it, the horse is fine. It's a process, not an event. We should connect with each horse. We shouldn't be treating them as, as just a number. And this is the key as far as frequency. Somewhere between 6 and 12 months, it moves from prevention to correction. So most horses, if you do it at 6 months, you're going to make sure that they stay in the preventive mode, not in the corrective mode. Some horses it's less, some horses it can go on beyond that, especially they're not chewing uh, uh, solid food. So somewhere between 6 and 12 months, you do twice a year, you're going to be well within the um, uh, uh, threshold of pain for most horses. All right, 
If you want to make an appointment for dentistry with us, go to equinedentistrywithoutdrama.com. You can't miss that. Equine Dentistry Without Drama. That's who we are. That's what we do. Um, you can go to the equine practice too. It gets the same spot. But Equine Dentistry Without Drama, you can't forget that. Click on it. Make an appointment. We go to almost every state in the nation. Um, I'm licensed in 10 states. Uh, and you can go to Equine Dentistry Without Drama. Make an appointment. You can look at the map. You can find how much we charge. Uh, you can find out if we go to that area. Uh, and how much you charge for going to that area. But I basically, uh, to come out of Florida, I go all the way up to Vermont, uh, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut. I also hit Seattle, Washington, Louisiana, um, Tennessee, Virginia, uh, Georgia, Car uh, South Carolina, that whole area. So I go to a lot of places. There's so many people want this. Okay. Also, if you're inspired and you think this is something you'd like to, to do, I want you to go to horsemanshipdentistryschool.com. This is a school that Melissa and I have put together. We're flat out excited about it. We've got some graduates that are out there actually doing dentistry now our way. We would like to cover this nation, if not the world, with people who understand that dentistry using horsemanship skills is by far and away doing it in the best interest of the horse. And we'd love to teach you. We'd love to teach you all the ideas that we've got here. It's all online now. It's so easy to do. Horsemanshipdentistryschool.com. Uh, right now, uh, you're going to see an option to get a booklet, and you should download that booklet. In fact, by the time I think about this, it's supposed to have a little pop-up. I forgot to do that, but it doesn't matter. It's going to pop up, um, or there's a button right there. Get the uh, booklet. Read about dentistry, horsemanship dentistry. Um, and if you're interested in learning all about what I just taught you right now, everything in this webinar, take the short course. It's called The Essentials of Equine Dentistry. Um, which is um, an online course. It'll take you maybe 10 hours to do. Uh, it has little quizzes in there. It has tons of photographs and everything I've said all spread out so you can really learn this. You become a much better horseman if you do it. That's available for any horseman anywhere who wants to become a good horse owner or if you just want to test the waters and see if uh, coming to an online school would be the way to do it. All right, and don't forget, I've written a bunch of books. Uh, just go to equinepractice.com books. Uh, the tenure of feudal laws of horsemanship is something that I wrote that is that we use every day for connecting with horses. It's awesome. If you don't have it yet, you should be getting it. If you want to hear about my life, uh, I wrote a book called Since the Days of the Romans, my autobiography. If you just like to have some uh, stories, the true and incredible stories of horse vet, um, that goes back to the, my past. All right, so I'm going to open this up to questions if anybody wants to ask them. Um, and I'm going to thank you. And I'm going to stop screen sharing. And I'm going to talk to you guys live. Let's see if I can do this. Stop screen sharing. Any second now. Hey, there I am. Okay. Who wants to talk? Who, want, who has some questions out there? If you don't have any questions, that's fine. You know, I can go home and do things. Um, somebody says I'm out of focus. I don't know if that's my brain or, or there's a smudge. Let me see. I'll grab a napkin here and see if I can just clean off that lens. How's that? Any better? Okay. Who likes my banner back there? Oh, donkeys. Um, my gosh. Horses, asses, and mules. Yes. Uh, donkey uh, is an ass. Um, uh, you know, Jackson Jenny's. And um, we don't do that many. Uh, we've got uh, many donks in the practice. We've got a couple of standard um, donkeys uh, that we do. But most people who don't, uh, who have donkeys, either don't call us for some reason. I'm not sure. But yes, they donkeys, uh, asses, um, mules. Um, they all have hips that aren't teeth. They constantly are chewing. They're basically equi equines, equidae, and um, so yes. Okay. All right, anything else? I go really fast. Uh, obviously, my passion is, is pretty crazy. Um, okay, the horse lives long enough. but will always lose all teeth and require soaked pellets or something similar to their food. Um, that's actually a really good question because um, 
No, the answer is no. They don't normally lose their teeth. These horses never would have lived this long in you know, tens of thousands of years if they all lost their teeth. So, uh, yes, the answer is most horses go uh, their full length with their teeth. The difference, though, is how healthy those teeth are. And I've seen a lot of these older horses uh, um, not lose teeth, but they have loose teeth, a little bit painful, um, some local infection, and, and, and the most common thing is a stale mouth. Um, we have five different smells that we've identified in a horse's mouth, and one of them is called stale. And these horses just stop in their tongue, and so they don't clean their mouth out, and they have this kind of stale smell in their mouth. And <clears throat> what I find is you take some of these old horses, they still have good teeth, uh, but you take those sources of pain away, their tongue starts to move around, the stale mouth, stale smell uh, goes away almost immediately, so that's kind of cool. So, um, uh, yeah, most horses keep their teeth. I will tell you this, there's a genetic possibility that some of these horses' teeth will just lose their, their some of these horses will lose their teeth no matter what. Just like, um, uh, sorry to all our fans out in Great Britain, I mean, I, that's where I came from 400 years ago, but um, there are certain genetic traits of people that lose teeth and other genetic uh, traits where the teeth remain healthy and perfect all their life. And I think that I can see this in some horses, uh, but it's not to a breed and it's not to um, an area like um, just South Florida. I can't put heads or tails, but I see some horses that have had good care and the teeth just rot away. They fall apart. And I think it has to do with the genetics makeup on the prism level of the, the um, makeup of the enamel. So I think some horses are just born with weak teeth and they just fall apart. Somebody asked if I come to Arizona. Uh, I do have a, a, a graduate out in Arizona. I should go out and see her sometime. Um, uh, there's, um, I'd like to get out there. There's a lot of people in Arizona who've asked me out there, but I just can't go out for one or two horses. And I'm not licensed in Arizona, so I would have to. Oh, yeah. Um, my wife has reminded me that if you want to put together a seminar or a clinic where you have like 15 horses, uh, I will come out and do that. But in Arizona, I'm going to have to have a veterinarian there uh, who will sponsor me to be legal. And that's just the way it is in Arizona. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Okay, Terry, see ya. Uh, let's see. Uh, if horses long uh, I have a 26-year-old. She has promised me to go to 40, <laughs> so I want to keep her teeth. Um, that reminds me, um, we just lost a horse in the practice who was, I think, 39 or 40 this, this past week, and uh, I've been taking care of that horse's teeth for 20 years, and it lost half of its teeth and uh, did just well. Uh, just because a horse loses his teeth, um, uh, you can keep them fat and happy. In fact, a long time ago, I wrote a blog called Fat and Happy on Eight Teeth. And they're supposed to have, let's see, 24 cheek teeth, and this horse had eight cheek teeth. So uh, two-thirds of its teeth were gone. And it was skin and bones when I got there. So I did a little bit of filing, got things cleaned up. But I spent most of my time teaching this person how to feed the horse with no teeth. And once the guy got it, uh, I came back six months later, and this is no lie. I said, where's the horse? They said, this is the horse. I said, no, no. This isn't the same pony I did. It's impossible. It was fat and happy and hair coat was glossy and everything. So, yes, remember, the teeth are only there to make a swallowable bolus. And if you can make food swallowable without the teeth, then the horse will be able to swallow the food. If the food can get past the teeth through the throat and get down the belly, they'll live just fine. Okay, can it be a small animal devent to sponsor you? Yeah, technically. That's it, what's really funny about these uh, veterinary boards. Uh, they're made up mostly of small animal vets who want to make sure that nobody comes in and does um, uh, dentistry on dogs. Um, but they don't understand uh, horse dentistry or they hear from their friends who are doing dentistry in horses and, and um, they just want to keep people out. But uh, there are some states that make it very difficult. So uh, if you can find a veterinarian who would like to sponsor me and then put on a clinic, uh, let me know. Uh, there's some travel costs getting out to Arizona and South Florida, but um, I would love to teach this, especially if there's somebody out there who wants to learn how to do this. That would be great. Uh, great. So wheels, it looks like I'm coming to Arizona, huh? Okay. 
uh, is there an age that <clears throat> we should stop floating teeth? Is there any validity to the argument that after mid-teens that the TMJ cannot adjust to changes to the mouse? Okay. Uh, you stop floating teeth when the teeth stop needing floating. Um, and I know that sounds like a ring around, but as the horse gets older, um, I move them from twice a year to once a year, somewhere around 25 years of age, maybe 30, somewhere in there. It all depends on the horse's genetics and how hard their teeth are because the teeth actually will get harder. And the harder they get, the less likely that they will get sharp edges. So um, I just use my judgment. Oftentimes I'll go in at six months and just do a partial, a touch-up, especially if he has flabby cheeks and he's got the uh, first lower cheek teeth down into the um, root system, uh, into what we affectionately call old horse tooth, that create these razor-sharp notches that are so painful to the horse. And sometimes I just do the first bottom cheek teeth and that's all I do on these older horses. So yes, they will tell you when it gets there. It's not like an absolute cutoff. It can be like, oh, well, we'll check him in six months. Okay, he doesn't need it this time or I'll just do a little touch up. Um, as far as the TM joint, uh, the temporal mandibular joint, that's what attaches the mandible um, to the jaw up here. And um, it's been, I've never believed that the TM joint has been a problem in the horse, never have. And now there's scientific evidence that's coming up in the past two years. There's a veterinarian out in the University of Saskatchewan in, in Canada who's done a lot of research on the temporal mandibular joint. It's really good research. And they cannot create, nor can they find one record ever being um, uh, reported of primary temporal mandibular joint disease in horse. And I know that there's anecdotal um, stories where vets have come and injected the TM joint and the horse starts chewing better. But um, I'm not too sure where that's coming from because they've actually taken parts of the jaw out. They've actually injected the jaw with something that causes pain temporarily uh, and they can't make the horse stop chewing. They can't make the horse painful. The temporal mandibular joint moves 25,000 times a day. It is so flexible and on post-mortem, if there is a problem, we would find textbooks and studies and reports that the TM joint is a problem, and it's not. And if you feel the TM joints below, that where the soft tissue, the muscles come together, the connective tissue, in almost every horse, if you feel the horse's left side below, right down in here, it's thicker than if you feel the right side. And I find that interesting. But I also found that horses chew one direction. They chew in a rotating uh, fashion, like this, and I call them right-sided chewers or left-sided chewers. And almost every horse that we float is sharper on the left side, almost by definition. On occasion, we'll get the other side. Just like there's a lot of people who are right-handed and there's some that are left-handed. And they have been able to show that if they inject the TM joint with this noxious uh, agent, they can alter the way the horse chews from being a right-handed chewer to left-handed chewer. I find that fascinating because I know that once we take the pain of the sharp teeth away, then the horse is allowed to move without restrictions, and that takes all the, uh, the pain away from the joint. So hopefully uh, that somewhat answers your question. The TM joint is just one of these things that everybody talks about, but there's no proof behind it. I think it's just like um, uh, anything else that has something that we can remember, like TMJ or Cushing's, you know, it becomes misunderstood so quickly. And now the scientists are getting in there and, and, and taking it apart, and they're now agreeing with me. I've only had one horse in 65,000 that had a temporal mandibular joint lockup after I floated. And I went back and saw the horse um, about an hour or so later. Um, and I went there. The horse, I could stick my hand on one side. It was fine. I couldn't stick my hand on the other side, and he was not eating. And I did a quick adjustment of the TM joint, which a chiropractic veterinarian had taught me how to do it. It was instantaneous. It took less than a second to do. And the horse immediately popped his jaw and went right back to eating as if nothing had ever happened. So that's not really temporal mandibular joint disease. That's lockup. And we all get that on occasion. Uh, okay, what else can I talk about? Christina, I hope that answered your question. A lot of people will listen to what I have to say. And um, it's not fitting in what you've heard. Uh, there's so much rhetoric out there, so many stories, so many things that are talked about in dentistry that are based in um, theories that I haven't seen hold up in all the years that I've been doing this. Uh, since 1983, so today this is 
33 years, 65,000 horses. And so I've amassed this volume of information that I'm giving to you guys. And um, okay, somebody wants to know about Cushing's. Uh, yeah, I'd love to talk. I think I've got it on. I, you know, I forgot to find out what's what's the next month. Do you guys have that anywhere? Is that what I've got coming up? Can you guys look that up? Yeah, the equine practice forward slash horse talk, and then it'll tell what the next one is. It's always the first Sunday of the month. Um, <laughs> Cushing's. <laughs> Don't get me started. That's one of my buttons. Uh, and obviously, this this isn't. We're talking about teeth. Okay, we're looking it up, right? Yes. Okay. Be patient, Jeff. Be patient. Uh, I hate to leave you hanging. I don't want you want to get into that. I mean, I've already gone an hour and fifteen minutes. And, and when is cushions? Uh, August seventh. All right, so that's going to be the August webinar. So you're going to have to wait till August before I tell you all about Cushing's. Uh, but I definitely have my thoughts on it uh, that may be different than what you're hearing. Uh, but I will tell you this: it's pretty much a pituitary tumor, uh, uh, hypertrophy of the pituitary. We don't know why it's it's occurred. It's one of the secondary diseases of the pituitary, along with diabetes insipidus and uh, inability to see increase and decrease in daylight. Just because your horse isn't shedding his hair coat doesn't mean he has Cushing's. That's the whole idea. He has a pituitary adenoma, and you're treating the pituitary. You're not actually treating the uh, increased ACTH. But that's your August. Next one is going to be revisiting the 10 irrefutable laws of horsemanship, which is a big hit the first time I did it, but I'm going to go a little bit more in depth this time. And I want to talk about uh, how you guys can connect with the horse in 30 seconds because we as equine dentists don't have 30 days. We don't have 30 minutes. We have 30 seconds to walk up the horse we've never seen before and introduce our hand and reach all the way back and feel the last cheek teeth with our fingertips and then slide a file in there and start filing down the teeth. That's what horsemanship dentistry is. If any of you watching this want um, want to know about how to do this, please stop by horsemanshipdentistryschool.com, download the booklet, uh, get the first module, the, the Essentials of Equine Dentistry, and, and study it and become part of this uh, movement of horsemanship dentistry as being the best thing for your horse. I want to thank everybody here tonight. If there are no other questions, um, this is just wonderful. Thanks for all of you sticking around to the end. Last chance, everybody. All right. Good night.